Hello. In this video, we are going to determine the commutator in the case of 2D angular momentum between the angle phi and the angular momentum, which we're going to write as L sub z. So recall that the commutator is the expression we get if we have the operators act upon a wave function in both possible orders, and then we subtract the results. If the commutator is found to be zero, then we say that the two operators commute. We can know them both simultaneously to essentially infinite precision, and they have a common set of eigenfunctions. If the commutator is found to not equal zero, that means that we cannot simultaneously know both of the properties of the operators at the same time to infinite precision, and it means that they do not share a common set of eigenfunctions. So here we have the angle phi times the angular momentum acting upon the wave function, and then we have the angular momentum acting upon the angle acting upon the wave function. Recall that by the conventions of the uh, nomenclature of quantum mechanics, that we operate it on the wave function from the operators starting from the right. So the nearest operator to the wave function acts upon it first. So effectively, this gives us the, here the angular momentum in the z direction will act upon the wave function. And then for the second expression, the angle operator will act upon the wave function. Next, we'd like to rewrite these expressions using the actual mechanical uh, values of these operators. So we keep the angle operator the way it was, and now we fill in the actual value of this operator, which is h bar over i, times the derivative with respect to phi, and this is going to act upon the wave function psi, so we put the psi in there. For the second term, we have the uh, angle operator, phi, and the way we use this particular operator is we simply replace it by the angle phi and multiply this angle times the wave function psi. So this gives us, we evaluate the nearest operator to the wave function, and we put in its express value on the board. So next, we have to operate with the second operator. So let's first just write down the actual um, meaning of the operator, and then in the next step, we'll actually have the operator act upon its operand. So for the angle phi, we simply multiply by the angle phi. It multiplies h bar over i times d psi d phi, and then we replace the angular momentum operator by its actual details, which is h bar over i times the derivative with respect to phi, and this is going to act upon phi times psi. For the first term here, we simply have the multiplication of three terms. We have the angle, we have h bar over i, which is simply a number, times the derivative of psi with respect to phi. Since all these commute, we can actually just rewrite them in a slightly different order. Put the h bar over i in front, just kind of pull it out in front. Now here we have a more interesting situation because we're taking the derivative with respect to phi of phi times psi. We always have to assume that psi is a function of all possible variables. So that tells us here we have to apply the product rule for differentiation. So recall that if we have, we try to take the derivative of two functions, so I'm trying to take the derivative, for example, with respect to x of the product fg, that one way to do it is systematic ways. First times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. 
So this particular case, that would give us f times the derivative of g with respect to x plus the second, which is g, times the derivative of x with respect to x. So this is the so-called product rule. We will find that in every case in quantum mechanics, when two operators do not compute, the reason why they do not compute is because at some point in the derivation of the commutator, we have to invoke the product rule. And we'll see right now uh, what that gives us. So if h bar over i is simply a constant, so that stays in front. And now we have to take the derivative with respect to phi of this product. So again, we have the first times the derivative of the second. So the first function is simply phi. So we take the derivative with respect to phi of psi, d psi, d phi, plus the second, which is psi, times the derivative of the first. So it's the derivative of phi with respect to phi. Let's write this out explicitly just to remind ourselves of what's going on here. Now, another important rule to keep in mind is that if I take the derivative of phi with respect to phi, this is simply going to be equal to 1. So we can rewrite our commutator expression up here as h bar over i times phi times d psi d phi minus h bar over i times phi d psi d phi and then we have to distribute our minus h bar over i times psi which is and that's just equal to one so we get minus h bar over i times psi we notice almost immediately that the first two terms are equal but of opposite signs so we can simply cancel them out and we're left with minus h bar over psi now, we had only introduced the function psi so that our operators would have something convenient to operate on. We omit that for the actual derivation of the commutator. So the commutator for the angle phi and the angular momentum in two dimensions is determined to be minus h bar over i. We have thus determined that the angle phi and the overall two-dimensional angular momentum cannot be known simultaneously. Those two operators do not commute. That may be a surprising result. So let's show another way to demonstrate the same point. So recall that the wave function for the particle in a ring is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 pi times e to the i m sub l phi, where m sub l is a whole number, where m sub l is an element of the integers. So now let's take a relatively simple situation. Let's take the case where we have this particular wave function with some specific m sub l. So just say that we have a specific m sub l value. We've picked it, doesn't matter what it is, but we've defined it to be one particular value. So now our next result, we want to determine the probability density. We want to find the probability that the electron will be at a particular angle around the, um, the ring. So recall that the complex conjugate for this wave function, we get by replacing i by minus i. So that's going to be 1 over the square root of 2 pi times e to the minus i m sub l. Once we've determined the complex conjugate, we can determine the probability density, which is psi star psi. And we'll put the particular values in and color code them. So the complex conjugate is 1 over the square root of 2 pi times e to the minus i m sub l v. The wave function itself is... 1 over the square root of 2 pi times e i m sub l phi. If we multiply these two expressions together, 
we notice that e to the minus i m sub L phi times e to the i m sub L phi gives us e to the zero, which is simply equal to one. So all that is left is to multiply one of the square root of two pi, which gives us the value of one over two pi. This is an interesting result, which is sometimes difficult to interpret. The probability density, the probability of finding the electron at any particular angle is equal to one over two pi. The important result here is that this expression does not involve the angle phi anywhere. Since it doesn't depend upon the angle phi, it tells us the probability of finding the electron at any particular angle is identical. And since the likelihood of finding the electron at any particular angle is the same as any other angle, it tells us that we have absolutely no idea where the electron is. So by having specified a specific angular momentum, so if we know the angular momentum as a specific value, it gives us, this, we have to give up all value, um, hope, of knowing where the electron actually is. So this confirms our notion, which may have been surprising when we uh, determine the commutator for the angle and for the angular momentum, that those two particular values do not commute. I thank you very much for your attention. Have a good one.